Thank you, Mr. Justice Reyes. Justice Bernabe. Counsel, um, you said that the act of referral by a skilled health professional is an exercise of a professional duty. You said that earlier. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Would you also consider it as a practice of religion? Uh, no, Your Honor, uh, because the practice of profession is a discipline uh, that requires a lengthy process of accreditation. Uh, a person who visits a hospital, like I said, is not looking for a theologian, is not interested in a religious debate. Uh, he or she is looking for an expert in a particular field. Uh, medicine or one of its sub-disciplines. And therefore, even if a person who happens to be deeply religious, right, uh, uh, if a person who happens to be deeply religious is practicing medicine, right, uh, the face that he or she uh, provides to a client is the face of a doctor, not the face of a religious believer. Okay. By the act of referring, is there any compulsion on the part of the conscientious objector to accept uh, a religious belief of another or um, reject his own belief? Uh, no, Your Honor. I think it's a purely sexual, I'm sorry, it's a purely secular concern of the government to ensure that a person who is denied access to RH information or service by a conscientious objector eventually obtains it as a consequence of that referral. See, uh, when one does an act of referral, would you already know the decision of the person being referred to? No, Your Honor. Then what is the purpose that uh, is being sought uh, to achieve by the act of referral? Uh, what, is being, what is sought to be achieved by the act of re referral is to provide that patient who is denied access to RH information or service, right, uh, what the law provides him, which is ultimately access to information and service that she couldn't get from a medical professional who is a conscientious objector. Now, assuming that the act of referral is both an exercise of a professional duty and a practice of religion, uh, how do you balance um, these two interests? I mean, which one would yield uh, to the other and why? Uh, Your Honor, we, we don't see it as a case of you know, as a zero-sum game where someone wins entirely and the other loses entirely. Uh, this is a, a compromise already. Uh, as you have mentioned, Your Honor, uh, in your discussion with Attorney Liban, your right to belief is absolute, but your right to act on the basis of your belief is subject to state regulation. This is an act, the refusal to perform RH service or, or provide the information. And that act is being regulated. And the state here is giving the conscientious objector a very generous concession. You are allowed to be unprofessional. You are allowed to not perform your duty, your regular duty as a doctor. But we will impose on you a very minor duty, the minor duty to, uh, to refer. Why? Because if we don't provide you with the minor duty to refer, we are creating a victim, and we are privileging absolutely your religious belief. And that, I think, would actually be a violation of the non-establishment clause if the state does that. Now, what is the implication if, if a skilled health professional does not perform his duty or um, be exempted from referring because of his religious conviction? I think, Your Honor, if a person uh, within a... Uh, appropriate set of facts, refuses to perform the duty to refer, then there is a possibility that the criminal sanctions might be triggered. Okay. Now, the right to speak includes the right not to speak. Yes, of course, Your, Your Honor. Right. Such that the right not to speak is also protected. Yes, Your Honor. Now, um, the RH law compels a person to speak by imposing on him the duty to refer. Would not the RH law violate the right not to speak? No, Your Honor, because uh, there's no such thing as a universal free speech doctrine. Uh, I think that particular doctrine applies to cases where uh, the government is compelling a citizen to speak, particularly in a public forum. Uh, and that is the classic case of the Ebralinag uh, 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 petitioners. In the case of Ebralinag, you have 
religious people who acting as citizens would like to exercise their uh, free exercise rights not to speak. And when the case came before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court recognized their right not to speak because they're being compelled as citizens to speak in a public forum uh, and are being imposed a public duty, a civic duty to what? Manifest, externally manifest loyalty to the state. That situation, the Eberlina situation, Your Honor, is entirely different from an RH situation because the RH situation involves the relationship between a medical professional who has the knowledge and expertise and a patient who doesn't have the knowledge and expertise. This doctor uh, presents himself or herself to everyone. He wears the hat of a doctor. He doesn't wear the hat of a, uh, of a bishop or a priest. He wears a particular hat that of a professional. And therefore, the public has the right to expect that this person will perform his or her duties as that person of science. And so the, the speech component is, is very minimal, if there is any speech component at all. Uh, the RH law is a health measure regulating the relationship of a doctor and a patient. It doesn't regulate the relationship between a citizen and another citizen. Under the implementing rules of the RH law, a conscientious objector, while mandated to refer, can provide messages of disclaimer. But after every act of referral or posting advertisement that communicates the fact that we have on the right to free speech and expression. Uh, well, number one, Your Honor, the, how the executive department will implement the RH law is independent of the question of the constitutionality of the text of the RH law itself. And so whatever problems, if any, the IRR might create as a consequence of the executive department's interpretation of the RH law will have to be tested in an as-applied basis. Because here, Your Honor, uh, this litigation is about a petition by anti-RH advocates seeking to test the facial validity of the statute, not the facial validity of the IRR which has nothing to do, which has little to do with the constitutional authority of the Congress to pass an RH statute. Now, would you say that by this, uh, this was the mantle of protected speech? I'm, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I, I got lost. No, I, I'm, well, the, this is okay. that you can provide um, okay. messages of disclaimer. So effectively, you are desecrating yourself all beyond the mantle of protected speech, uh, the act of referral with a disclaimer. I think, Your Honor, that the policy of the statute is focused on providing access uh, to RA service and information. And so ultimately, so long as the patient is not converted into a victim and is able to obtain RA information <laughs> or service, okay, the government would have very little concern over how that, uh, how that function is performed or whether or not in, in providing the act of referral, the public health professional also says, yeah, but I'm also an anti-RH statute. I think this statute you know, violates my religious liberty or, or will send you to, to hell or anything like that. I think ultimately if, if the citizen, the patient who wants access to RH information and service is referred and able to obtain access to RH information or service, no criminal sanctions will apply. And the, the free speech implications would, would vanish. Okay, thank you, counsel. Thank you, Ms.